tonight. Glad for God's mercy and His grace. So let's look at Him in prayer. Father, we give you thanks for all the good things that have come, our trials, our tribulations, our burdens, and we thank you most of all for your Son, Jesus, that gave His life to free us from our sins, and Lord, gave us the free gift of eternal life. We ask that we might be able to be a blessing to somebody in this life, say something to change the direction of their lives and point them to you. For those that are uh, in need tonight uh, for physical healing, we pray that you would touch them and bless them. I ask God for those that are needing finances tonight that you would help us some way that we might help them and lift them up. Watch over, guide us, and keep us in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. <coughs> I go to the doctor yesterday, and he said, uh, put the paddle up in the left eye, and I read the bottom line. Amen. Put it up in my right eye and I couldn't read the bottom line, just barely couldn't read that. When he came in, he said, you're not supposed to be able to do that. I said, well, I've been extraordinary all my life. <laughs> <laughs> Things that you can't do. But it'd be about a month, he said he'd seen me in about a month, and then uh, check my eyes, and get me some glasses, but until then I'm going to have to wear these on my nose. I don't really like it. But, can't read without them, but I, I can see good without them. Galatians, the second chapter tonight. Uh, we'll start at the eighth verse, is how far we got last week. Uh, just take about two or three minutes to bring you back up to date. Uh, Galatians is a book that Paul writes uh, and t telling them that. Because they had a problem, he's telling them the, the resolution, the results of how to resolve the problem. And the problem was that there had some Jews that came into the fellowship at Galatia, and they were telling them, in order for you to be in the right relationship with God, and in order for you to be uh, saved and where you need to be, uh, you need to be circumcised. So what they were doing, they were Jews trying to bring them back under the law. Now, a lot of churches today, so many, that they will try to get people back under the law. They try to become legalistic and say, well, you're, you're, you're saved by grace, but in order to stay saved, you've got to keep the law. You, you've got to do certain things. Well, Paul's going to cover that tonight. Uh, about how we get saved and how we stay saved. One of the things that he starts out in the first chapter is that he was not called by, by a man. He was not called by men. He did not receive the gift of preaching from any man. It was taught to him by the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, it, was, it all came by grace. He said, after I was saved, I, went to, I met the Lord on the road to Damascus. I went to Damascus. Uh, there, after Ananias came in and laid his hands on me, uh, the scales fell off my eyes. I received the gift of the Holy Ghost. I was baptized. I ate, and I started preaching. And he said, from Damascus, I went into Arabia, and I was there and came back after three years. And then he said, after 14 years, I went up to Jerusalem to make sure that what I was preaching went along with what the apostles were preaching. And he said, when I went into them, I took two fellows with me. I took Titus and I took uh, uh, Barnabas with me. And he said that Titus, being a Greek, they didn't, they didn't compel him to be circumcised. So he's certifying that grace plus nothing minus nothing saves you. And now we're down to the eighth verse. Uh, for he that brought effectual in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. This verse means that as they recognized that Peter was sent, and he was an apostle to preach the gospel unto the Jews. And he said they recognized that I was saved, and I was sent unto the Gentiles to preach the gospel unto the Gentiles. So the established two things that Peter here at this meeting and everybody that was there in that meeting agreed with him that Peter was 
was sent to the Jews and he was sent to the Gentiles. Ninth verse, and when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillows, perceived the grace that was given unto me, that they gave me the right, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision. Only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. So they they gave them the right hand of fellowship because they had nothing to add about the, the church at Galatia or anywhere else being circumcised in order to be saved. So Paul had been preaching grace, the love of God, the blood of Jesus Christ, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and so the whole group that he met with there in Jerusalem said that, that's what we're preaching. We're on the same page. We're all preaching and teaching the same things. So they gave him the right hand of fellowship. They shook their hands. They got ready to leave. And they said, just one thing we want you to do. We want you to remember the poor. And so that's something that's carried through on up to the, today. And our church is a very giving church to people that don't have We've learned that God blesses that. So they wanted Paul to remember that. And he said that I always do. Now the 11th verse, we're going to see some controversy. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face. Now they didn't get in a fist fight. They didn't argue. But he confronted him. I've always been this kind of person. And I always admire a person like this. If you've got a problem with anybody or a question to ask about anything, always go to that person. Don't ever go and ask somebody else what they think. If you've got something on your heart and on your mind, just belly right up and go right up. And I found this. It's how you approach anything is how it's received. Go in tenderness. Go in kindness. Go in love and and. and uh, go in humility. I promise you it will always work and it will always be received. And uh, Paul said that when he came to Antioch, I approached him, I withstood him, I approached him to the face. Because he was to blame. Because he was to blame. Now, think of this. Peter was one of the first disciples that Christ chose. Peter walked with Jesus through the crucifixion, resurrection, and 40 days after that, Jesus showed himself of many infallible proofs to the disciples. Now, Paul, later on, he, he got saved, and God called him to preach. Now, the lesser person in the eyes of the world is going to the most sufficient <coughs> person and going to get him straightened out. Right. Now, as a preacher, I can be wrong. As a Christian, you can be wrong. There's none of us that are right all the time. Would you agree to that? Amen. None of us are right all the time. But, God is never wrong. Amen. He is never wrong. His word's never wrong. So as long as you, as long as I stay in the covers, we're safe. But if we get outside the covers, it's when problems begin to arise. And so Peter was having a problem. And we're going to see the problem he was having was because of peer pressure. Right. That's all it was. Peer pressure. And trying to go along to please somebody else. Now what was he to blame for? Twelfth verse. For, bef for before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles, but when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. Now he tells the church at Galatia, when I went up and met with him in Jerusalem, they were fine with me just preaching grace because they were just preaching grace. But, the group that came from James, when they arrived and got there, that Paul, or uh, Peter, began to withdraw himself 
out of the fellowship of the Gentiles. He began to move aside from them. And he began to gather himself in just with the Jews. Now this is where cliques start. This is where denominations start. This is where new church doctrine starts. So that was a problem that they were having. Peter was doing wrong and Paul confronted him about the wrongdoing that he was doing. 13th verse, and the other Jews disassembled likewise with him insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. So whatever you do, you can't just do it by yourself. Whatever you do is going to affect not only you, but other folks around you. So Peter withdrew himself because of peer pressure from the Jews that came from James. And then the other Jews started pulling away from the Gentiles. And it said that they got so carried away with it that Barnabas, he began to withdraw away from them too. So you got your two churches started. Maybe they wasn't aware of it, but that's what was happening. If Paul wasn't going to get this thing straightened out, he was going to have a church just with the Gentiles, and then he was going to have a church <coughs> just with the Jews. That's the reason we got so many different denominations today, because we, we split hairs. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I believe you've got to do this and this and this. And before long, you just get completely out of whack. So uh, they, were, they were separated, they were being carried away by Jews that came in that said you get saved by grace, but the way you get sa stay saved is that you've got to keep the law. You've got to get circumcised. 14th verse, but when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said, unto Peter before them all. Now he didn't call Peter off to the side because this needed to be an open air discussion because it had been done all together in the church. Now if he had just taken Peter out back and talked to Peter and then they came back in and shook hands and he had left, I'll guarantee you Peter just went on doing what he had always done. But since everybody was involved in it, and this wasn't a <coughs> fuss or a fight over where we're going to build a new church or what color pews are we going to have, this was about salvation. This was about the teaching of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, how anybody gets their name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And he said that uh, he was stood it or took him right before them all. If thou being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles and not as do the Jews. Why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? Now that's a good verse to explain. Is that clear as mud to you? <laughs> that's a good one to explain. All he's saying is this. You are a Jew, but you know that Gentiles are sinners by nature. Jews were God's chosen people. Came from Abraham. He chose Abraham to become father of a great nation. But he said, here you are. You're saying that you're saved by grace. But then you're living like a Gentile. You're living like a sinner. Because you're saying you're saved by grace, but you've got to be circumcised. You're living like a sinner. He said, if, if you being a Jew, and you know that you're lost and you got saved by grace and you've been teaching the Gentiles that they need to be saved by grace. Why are you going and compelling the Gentiles to be circumcised? If Judaism and being a Jew would get you to heaven, why did you receive Christ as your Savior? Why did he die on the cross? He said, you're living just like the Gentiles. Fourteenth verse will school a little further. But when I saw that they not that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, 
I said unto Peter to them all, that if thou being a Jew livest after the manner of the Gentiles, not after the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? Now that's a question, 15 verse. Who, we who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles. Now, we all understand that God chose Abraham to become the father of a great nation. And the Jews were God's people. But the Jews could not be saved just by being a Jew. Christ said, for we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. Peter knew that. He knew that he'd been born again of the Spirit of God. There were two types of people, God's people and the heathen people. The Jews were God's people. And the Gentiles, by nature, they were sinners. Now he says in the 16th verse, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Now what is justification? When he says justified, what's he talking about? Just as if I'd never sinned. Just as if I'd never sinned. Put in the right relation with God. Now, he said, what justifies us? What's a, what puts us in the position as if I had never sinned? Blood of Christ. Love of Christ, the blood of Jesus, being born again of the Spirit of God, Puts us in the position. Now, the works of the law can't justify anybody. And I find this quite interesting. When God instituted sacrifices, He chose blood sacrifices. Now, why? Blood is the life of the flesh. Life is in the blood. So Christ, the God took animal sacrifices all the way through the Old Testament. And to atone for the people's sins. It wasn't forgiveness for their sins. It was an atonement for their sins. He would take and, and the high priest would take and he would slay the animals, present a blood atonement. The life was in the blood. It represented when they took an animal's life and the blood was drained from that animal, then it was atoning for the sins of a man. So what Christ did when he gave his life on Calvary he brought justification as though we had never sinned. Something that the law couldn't do. The law did one thing for man. What was that? Showing that he was sinning. Yeah, it not, brought us knowledge of sin. That's all it did. Until the law was given, man didn't know what sin was. And God said when he began to write the commandments, then man could understand this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. This is wrong. So at the first time, they could understand what sin was. So you get justified by faith. You get saved by grace, not by the law. 17th verse, but if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners. Now, hold on to this. Is found sinners is therefore Christ the minister of sin. God forbid now, he's saying, Peter, we got saved by the grace of God. We got saved because Jesus died on the cross. He gave his life in our place. He was our substitute so that we've been born again of the Spirit of God. And he said, we are found sinners. If we're found sinners, then the Gentiles are sinners. What caused us to be sinners? Look at the last part of that verse. What caused us to be sinners? Is therefore Christ the minister of sin? Did Christ come and preach and bleed and die in order to make us sinners? That's all he's saying. What caused us to be sinners? Born. Yeah. Descendants of Adam. Because Adam and Eve 
ate the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden. And we are the descendants of Adam. Because of our fleshly nature, we are born sinners. And we choose <coughs> to stay sinners if we reject the blood of Jesus Christ. So he's making a point. If, if you're saved, what saved you? If you're born again, what caused you to be born again? Did Christ go into Calvary? Did Jesus Christ make you a sinner? No. He's driving home a point. No. 18th verse. For if I build again the things which I destroy, I make myself a transgressor. I want you to underline the word build in your Bible. I want you to write up above it, rebuild. Now, I want somebody to go to Colossians 2 and 14 and read it for us. Colossians 2 and 14. And then we're going back to the 18th verse. I know this is not real exciting tonight, but it's necessary. It'll all tie together here when we get to the end of the chapter. Colossians 2 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. All right. What's the ordinances that he's blotting out? The law. law. The law. What did he do with the law? Nailed, nailed it to the cross. He nailed it to the cross. Why? Because the law was a curse to us. And the reason it was a curse is because nobody could keep it. And the law never, God never gave the law <laughs> intending that man could be saved by it. He gave it to show us what sin was and what sacrifices that had to be made in order to, to uh, atone for our sins. 18th verse, for if I build... And it should, it's a better rendering, rebuild. If I rebuild again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Now, what's he talking about? Go back to the law and try to do it again. The law was put on the cross with Christ. Christ died, nailed the, cross, nailed the law to the cross. Now, Paul said, if I go back and try to get the law again, and rebuild that and bring it back into Christianity, he said, what am I? He said, I'm a transgressor. I am sinning. Now let's give you for an instant. We know that we're saved by grace. But what if I was cunning enough to convince you or we had a group of people would come in and cunning <laughs> enough to to sow some seed of doubt in your mind like this. Uh, mildew. You've got to keep the law of mildew in order to be in the right standing with God. How's that sound? Do you know that's in the Bible? There was a mildew law. What did you have to do if you had some clothes that was mildewed under the law? Burn. Yeah. You set them aside. Had to gather them up. Had to take them to the priest. Present them to the priest. And in seven days, the priest would watch it. And if the mildew didn't increase and get bigger and grow on it, then you'd go through a sanctification process and then you could take it back home and wash it and go on and use it. Now that's a law. Now if you want, we know we're saved by grace, but to really get close to God, we've got to keep the mildew law. See, that's what Peter was doing because these brothers had come in and said, you've got to get circumcised, bring them back under the law. Well, let's, let's add another one. I think I told you this not long ago. 
that on the Sabbath day, the Sabbath is Saturday, on Saturday, that's the last day of the week. Sunday we worship on the first day of the week because that's when Christ resurrected. Sabbath is the day that God rested from all of his labor. And on the Sabbath day, you couldn't do any work or any cooking or anything. But you could only travel so far away from your property. Now let's say we're saved by grace. We've got to keep the mildew law. We're saved by grace. And uh, we got to keep the law of the Sabbath. Even though Christ resurrected on Sunday and died for our sins. So uh, let's put that in there. Would that go over to your house or do you just eat bologna on Saturday? <laughs> See, it's got to stop somewhere because you can't take just one law. If you're going to take one law, then you've got to take all the law. There's no ending to it. So when Christ died, he blotted the law out. He took the handwriting of the ordinances <coughs> And he had it nailed to the cross. And now he said, if you want your sins forgiven, believe that I died and shed my blood and resurrected the third day. Confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead and thou shalt be saved. Plus nothing, minus nothing, just grace. 19th verse, for I... Through the law and dead to the law, that I might live unto the God, live unto God. Now he said, "For I though through, uh, through the law am dead to the law, that I might live to God." Now everything that the law has stood for, we Christ <coughs> died for it in order to remove it out of the way that we might have eternal life and we might be freed from traditions and ordinances and laws of these kinds. Don't it, don't it make you feel good that you don't have to come in church and, and go through 614 commandments to see whether or not you've done anything wrong? Amen. Don't it make you feel good to know that when you do something wrong, you already know that it's wrong? Aren't you glad that when you know that it's wrong that you can say immediately, God forgive me, and it's gone? Amen. The Jews couldn't do that, and the law couldn't do that. They were bound. They could not have forgiveness of their sin. They were bound. They just had knowledge of it, but not forgiveness. 20th verse, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Well, if you get crucified, how can you live? He said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. I'm crucified with Christ. I live, yet not I, but it's Christ that lives in me. All that's telling us is, Crow, you accepted the crucifixion. When you accepted Christ being crucified on Calvary and His blood being shed, you were accepting that He took your place. He took your place. He forgave you of your sin. Your sin, my sin was forgiven before I ever accepted it. Dickie, your sin almost 2,000 years ago was forgiven before you were ever born. But then there had to be acceptance when we reach out to Christ through faith and say, I want to be saved. I believe it. See, Christ died for sin one time. He'll never have to do it again because it was sufficient. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Substitute. Bled, died, buried, resurrected for me. He's telling the church at Galatia, grace, 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 grace. That's all it is. I have...
have been in churches that have said, in, and I have a dear friend that believes this with all his heart, in order for him to be saved, he's got to be baptized. So if you get saved by grace and you've got to be baptized, that's adding to grace. You're putting a stipulation on grace. We're going to close with this, 21st verse. And this set explains all the rest of that chapter that we just read. I do not frustrate the grace of God. <coughs> For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. If a man can get saved any other way than that of Jesus Christ, then Jesus went to Calvary for nothing. If we could get saved by any other method, baptism. Sunday night, I couldn't sleep. I, I don't know, I just, I could not sleep. So I got up and turned Christian channel. That's a hard thing to watch. I'll tell you what, it'll make you backslide. It sure won't make you get close, it'll make you mad. I got furious. <laughs> The first guy that came on is uh, a Reverend Popoff. Mm -hmm. And he popped off. <laughs> <laughs> he had, and I'm talking about now, he's world famous and worth God only knows how much money. But he's got this sacred water. And it looks like, you know, the little, when you go to McDonald's and you tell them you want a little ketchup, they want <laughs> <a little package. clears throat> You get this miracle water. And then after, and you send for it. Then he had testimonies. Man, I was saying, I'm going to learn something now. So he had testimonies. And the testimonies was, first lady came up in the line after he had preached. They didn't show none of his preaching, just testimonies. I went to my mailbox and I got $30,000. Glory to God. Did you hear that? Miracle water, miracle water, miracle water. Oh, Next one came up. The best one was I got $725,000. Glory to God. Miracle water, miracle water. Now you just think. You're sitting there and you're ignorant of God's word. And you're ignorant of Jesus Christ and Calvary and the blood. And here you, all you've got is $25 to your name and haven't got enough money to pay you rent. And that old boy's telling you just call him and he'll save you that miracle water for $25 and you've already heard a line from here to the center from 20, 30,000 to 375,000, they just went to their mailboxes and it was there. What would you do? <coughs> I know people take their last dollar and buy a lottery ticket. That's the only hope they had, buying groceries next week. I found a turn pop off off. <coughs> he done popped off enough. <laughs> then I said, I'll watch a movie on Jesus. So they had a movie on Jesus. Now he was a radical. He was a radical person that caused division among people. And he was a good man, but he got the Jewish religion and the nation worked up. And so he was another form of radicalism. Mary Magdalene, she was his lover and possibly his wife. And they probably had children together. No wonder I couldn't sleep. <laughs> Barbara, she got up and said, you can't sleep. I said, no, I can't sleep. About three or four o'clock in the morning. You don't need to watch that stuff. That's awful. I wished it had Looney Tunes on. I watched that. I got it out there. So he just tells us, don't, don't mix 
together. Don't get confused. Don't frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness, your right standing came by the law, then Jesus wasted his time in going to the cross and dying for our sins. That's what he was whipping up on Peter about. Because Peter had got off and he had started separating himself from the Gentiles. And those Gentiles, they had been saved just like Peter had been saved. But it's so easy if we're not careful for for factions to come in and divisions to come in and start adding. This good friend of mine, bless his heart, he believes with all his heart you've got to get baptized to be saved. You get saved for grace, but you still got to be done. I believe water baptism is important. I believe it's an ordinance of the church. But if you get saved and you die before I can get you baptized, son, you're going to heaven just Amen. like anybody else. Amen. Amen. Don't make any so always remember, you're settled in Jesus, you're settled in grace, plus nothing, minus nothing. You're here because of Jesus, and you're going to heaven because of Jesus. Okay?